I've been waiting for Ascension Island, okay? One Piece has a ton of pirate references, like we got Blackbeard and the Kraken. And so Ascension Islands were on my list. The giant island turtle is such a cliche in pirate stories. I was like, we gotta have something like that. And the more the series passed on, I thought maybe that's not gonna happen. Maybe at best we got the island that Usopp landed on. That was kind of sentient. Or maybe Laboon or Thriller Bark even count as a sentient island, I guess. Especially because I was saying a ton in Dress Rosa that maybe we're not gonna get weird arcs like this anymore. And then guess what? We got Zoe. Zoe is a giant elephant roaming the ocean, which first of all, just like mwah, chef's kiss, by the way, I've never felt this much childhood wonder since Jaya and Skypea. As a side note, this isn't the first ocean elephant that I've seen. In Breath of the Wild, there's Varuda, another ocean elephant. And if I had a nickel for every time I've encountered a giant ocean elephant, I would have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. And so I'm thinking, this has to be a reference to something, right? So I tried searching everywhere for any kind of reference or sign or story or mythos of a giant ocean elephant because it feels like this should be referencing something, but I don't know what. So I'm really curious, is this a reference to something that I'm just unaware of and could not find? Or am I just dreaming and this is a total coincidence? Anyways, um... Everything about Zoe just feels like a fever dream, right? There's talking animals. Let's put a pin on that for a second. And there's also the millennium old gigantic elephant, which is where I have a theory. Well, my first guess was that Zanisha and all of the other animals have to be the result of a devil fruit. After thinking about it for a little bit more, I don't know if Zanisha's height or age is the result of a devil fruit, mostly because and to be fair, this is a really mediocre theory, but Zanisha didn't have spirals around the mist it had. Okay, <laughs> okay, hear me out. Almost every time, with the exception of like a few panels, almost every time that we have seen a devil fruit being used, there are spirals in the clouds that are created. And this has happened all the time. This happened when Chopper got his monster point for him. This happened in this arc when Brook used the Soul Parade move. It happens when enemies with Devil Fruits use it as well. And it happens with Luffy's Gear 2 and 4 and probably 3, I don't remember. But I'd say it is purposeful since there are too many instances where this does happen, but also a couple of instances where it doesn't. But I'm saying that it's likely, it's pretty likely that Zanisha and all of the other minks are not the result of a devil fruit, which then creates even more questions. Like if Zanisha doesn't have a fruit ability, then I, that doesn't help me. I don't know why Zanisha would be the way that it is or why all the minks also talk. But there are so many weird things about it. Like why is it cursed to walk around everywhere and why does it need instructions? It's weird. Alongside Zoe are the minks. Minks are sentient animals, which also give me a few questions because Chopper was able to talk because of his human devil fruit ability. But then we have everyone here in Zoe that can seemingly talk without a human devil fruit. We have seen plenty of talking animals before, like fishmen, I think, are a perfect example of this. Mermaids are a big one, but there's also Buggy's crew that had a couple of them. There was Mary and the sheep people in Punk Hazard, none of which, as far as I'm aware, are devil fruit users. This was explained in Zoe as humans simply being like a subcategory of the same species as every other sentient talking animal. But I don't know. I feel like there has to, there has to be more to it than just that, right? Especially with how it relates to Zanisha and the creation of Zoe. As for the world building, now look, I love Skypea and Fishman Island, but I didn't think we would get to see anything like it again. I thought that after Punk Hazard, it was just going to be speedrunning boss after boss and fun adventure time was over. But Zoe has that grand sense of adventure without needing to jump into the next boss. This arc gives me a lot of Skypea vibes and not just from the mythical, unexplainable nature of the elephant or the ancient civilization on the top of the island. But just the awe, the, the wonder in seeing the logistics of how this elephant island works. How the island operates with all the flooding and how the residents live both in and outside of the forest. 
this one picture contains so much world building. I love that it's mostly visual too. Like we don't get a lot of information about this. We see the pineapple trees that might have been specifically grown to be lived in. We got the ship that might have been sucked up by Zanisha. We get to see the style of outfits that characters wear. We even get to learn about a lot of the diet and social habits. Similarly to how a uh, fish man don't eat fish, minks don't eat mammals or furry mammals. You get the idea. I only wish that we got to see these characters a little bit more. Like, yeah, we saw Nami and Sanji interacting with the minks and those were cute moments. Sanji definitely would have wanted to stay on that island just a little bit more. Maybe Chopper too. Chopper saw a reindeer on that island, which, okay, Chopper, look, you're cute, but you got no riz. You got to work on that, buddy. But it is a weird dichotomy that on the one hand, I like that it was short. I really like that it was short. I don't want this to be longer. But on the other hand, I don't think we even got to know what the dog woman's name was or really see a lot more of these interactions from these characters. At the very least, we're going to see a lot more of them in Wano and probably in the next arc, considering the rabbit just, um, I guess, just hopped onto the ship. I'm actually really excited about this. This is a weird dynamic. Both the lion turtle guy and the rabbit being prominent characters in the next arc is just not something I was expecting. A lot of the things that Zoe does really well for me was just the fact that it was under 50 chapters. I am so glad. These smaller arcs are so good. We could have easily had like a fight with Jack and stretch things out, but I'm so glad that we didn't. Every chapter was dense and it gave us a lot more exposition while also tying a lot of other characters and arcs together. It was like a nice little cool down period before bigger things were about to happen. So in order to actually get to Zoe, the crew has to get on this pink lizard and this pink lizard, to be fair, is adorable and we get to see how tedious the journey to get all the way up there was. Even just for this dragon figure, it took like an entire day to get up. And we don't really get any details as to how everyone else got up top. The pink lizard did not need to have this big of a moment, all right? We have a very dramatic, sad moment with pink lizard. We even got Robin adoring the dragon, followed by a nice panel of her thinking and laying the flowers down on its uh, grave thing. It was cute. I did, in fact, like the pink dragon. The actual plot of Zoe was way darker, all right? This wasn't a nice, calm, relaxing arc. This was horrible. There is some pretty dark lore surrounding Zoe. And, and okay, here's some notes that I gotta share with you before I finished reading Zoe because, wow, the story hits so much more differently after you finish reading Zoe. So we essentially learned that someone showed up in Zoe one day searching for a Wano ninja who was not there, couldn't find him, and just started torturing. I think this line here saying how can you give someone something you don't have just says more than I could ever explain. It is utter desperation. It is such a tragic line. And it was a pretty big shock to see the torture platform with a cat and dog on it. That was like the most gory scene I think we've ever seen in One Piece so far. Have there been bad moments before? Yeah, sure. But have we ever focused on them so much? Have we ever gotten like a clean zoom in on some of the gore? The only other time I could think of would probably be Ace and Whitebeard in Marineford. Which, yeah, it was really messed up. And I thought, okay, the Wano Ninja was not there. And I say that because I could not believe how hard the Minx leaned into this secret. This was like a level of commitment to the utmost degree, all right? Limbs were lost, civilizations were on the brink of collapse, and Rizo is actually alive and well. And you know what? Th that's a power move. We got the Wano Ninja, who even himself said, you did not have to go this hard. As a, oh man, as a, as a side note, by the way, I was really worried the ninja was going to look weird. I was like, oh no, Luffy's hyping up the ninja. It's going to be like a joke. It's going to be like a Mermaid in Water 7 situation, right? It's going to be a weird looking ninja. And it was. It's a weird ninja. That being said, I did actually enjoy the ninja both wanting to keep his honor and pride and seriousness about the fact that he is a ninja 
with the fact that he just folds at some point and starts doing tricks and stuff for the Straw Hats. We got to see like him do shadow clones and ninja stars and he's disappearing and he's starting to say some really depressing stuff about himself. Like, come on, buddy, you're supposed to be cool right now. You don't have to sneak in the fact that you're pretty lonely. So we saw a lot of people caring for Zoe, one of which was the lion guy that was a part of Big Mom's crew because I did not expect the lion guy to put himself in danger after he saw what the Straw Hats did. Like, yeah, when he showed up, I thought that things could have gone really bad, especially with Big Mom's influence. But then we get to see the lion guy just coming in and covering everything up. Zoe meant so much to this lion guy that he would rather take the L on this one. I didn't expect him to do that. He's like, I'll take the fail. I can't attack people who saved my village. And I respect that. Now, sure, he got blasted by Capone. But still. Also, while I mentioned Capone, in Dress Rosa, I was thinking... There is no way that he teamed up with Big Mom, right? Like, surely it can't be. Because I didn't expect Big Mom to team up with any rookie in the same way that I don't expect Kaido to team up with Kids Group. But then again, as we saw in Zoe, she totally did. Big Mom teamed up with Capone. So what I want to know is, what is Capone's deal? Like, what does he have to gain from all of this? He mentions that you either become an emperor or follow their rules. And, well, I think Capone's trying to keep his head down and maybe trying to get on her good side. But why? Well, maybe if anyone's gonna become the new underground ruler and it's not gonna be Doflamingo, I think Capone could pull it off. And so we see Capone working with Big Mom as he just kidnaps everyone into the castle, which, by the way, the transition into the castle is really cool. And it is inside the castle where we get an even weirder twist. Because Sanji had a lot more lore than I thought he did. Because for some context, Sanji was in North Blue and was found in East Blue. And you can't easily travel from one ocean to another. I thought that the only way Sanji managed to travel from one ocean to another was because of the Zeph incident. When they got stranded at sea, I thought Zeph and Sanji were thrown into East Blue. But here, we get an entirely different, maybe, story. Where Sanji and maybe his family at some point went to East Blue, and then Sanji just left his family. And so now he's being kidnapped back in. It explains the wanted poster. It makes sense. It was something that we were clearly setting up. But I did not expect us to foreshadow something like this and then immediately do it like 10 chapters later. Honestly, that's a power move. It's like Chekhov's gun, but the second you see it, you get shot. I, I mean, now I got to talk about the wedding, right? Like this really transitions really well to the wedding. So for the longest time, I found it weird that family wasn't a big part of One Piece. Found family? Yes, absolutely. Almost everywhere. Blood-related family? No. Almost never in One Piece. But here we are getting set up relating to... <laughs> get it? Relating? Relating to family. Big Mom is entirely focused on a deal that was made which concluded via marriage. So a big question that everyone's got to be asking, right? It's like, what is the... Well, I can't believe I'm going to say this. What's the deal with the deal? Seriously, what is this deal that Big Mom has made with Sanji's family? We mentioned that the Vin Smoke family uh, was one of very secretive assassins. So maybe she's doing this as a way to grow her power? Now, I don't think Sanji would leave the crew. It feels weird for him to just do that 800 chapters in. But I don't know what his plan would be to come back. It very much felt like a hostage situation, and it's why I'm interested in how stuff is going to go down. Especially because the plotline is asking Luffy to stealthily make his way in there. Especially because I don't expect Luffy to really sneak up in there into Big Mom's place and just grab Sanji and then stealthily walk away. I like that this is setting up a very Sanji-oriented arc. He hasn't really had one of those. Nami has been uh, a prominent character who's been pushing the story along or having these moments that relate back into the themes of her arc. But now that I think about it, Sanji really hasn't gotten the spotlight since 
since ever, I think. Since Barati A, maybe? Barati? Sorry, it's one of those two. Because sure, Sanji might have had a lot of moments, whether they're fighting or cooking related or women related, but what themes or stories in any arc has he really gotten the spotlight in? I don't know of one in the same way that I could think about almost every other character, which is weird. So I like this. It's, it's giving my boy some story impact. We can already see this kind of happening when the crew heads off and we see the importance of Sanji. We get a scene where Luffy says that he's hungry and he wants food, and it leads directly into a very silent moment. Something that I actually didn't talk about, but feel like I should have, and after reading Zoe, definitely will, is the cover pages for One Piece. Specifically, Jimbei's cover story, because throughout his adventure, he managed to stumble onto a poneglyph. The reason why this matters is because he also mentioned eventually stumbling back to the crew one day, which means that it might be possible for this poneglyph to actually play a role in the story. I don't know what it would really do. The poneglyphs are kind of like a wild card until we get more context. But oh boy, did we get context because Zoe was an info dump. I was surprised because we weren't supposed to get lore. We weren't supposed to know about the One Piece or poneglyphs. Seriously, when was the last time that a character talked about the One Piece? Marineford? We now know that we can find it via road poneglyphs that specifically talk about Raftel. Which either means that the One Piece isn't Roger's treasure, or that the island was so important that Roger put his treasure there for a different reason. Either way, I think it means that the island is a pretty big thing to note. Because if poneglyphs, these over-century-year-old blocks, talked about an island, then there's a lot more going on with Raftel than just Roger's treasure. It is something that is so important that we had to obscure the location of that single island by having it connected via other islands. It is something that you can only find by reading all four poneglyphs. I think that's great. We already know that Big Mom and Kaido have one of these poneglyphs. We have already been building towards these characters. We know we're going to have to go towards them anyways. And now it makes it even more impossible to just walk away. And while you could technically cheese your way to Raftel with just three poneglyphs, I like the idea of Raftel being in 3D space because that means that you would need all four poneglyphs. It means that you're not going to be able to find Raftel just on the ocean, but instead it means that Raftel could be an irregular island like Skypea or Fishman Island or Zoe. The exposition towards these poneglyphs also put a lot of importance on Wano, Wano was the country that made the poneglyphs, and it's where we're going. It's where Odin lived, who traveled with Roger. And we've learned that Odin's execution was because of Wano's border restrictions that was enforced by Kaido. So this arc gives us a chance to learn more about Zoe and Wano's connection, and it gives us a more personal goal through Momo's willingness to remove Wano's borders. And of course, it is time... I gotta talk about the reverie. The reverie, it's happening. Oh man, it's happening. First off, just the charm of getting a lot more screen time from this character that we haven't seen in such a long time. Just boof, it hit me. I was not prepared. And it's not just for Vivi, it is for all of the other characters that we've met along the way. It's what really made me realize that like, this is happening. This is happening. There have been a lot of things that have changed since the start of the series. Marineford and Fishman Island were really big shifts into how I imagined the reverie would be affected. Not only that, but we have Alabasta and the Dressrosa situation bringing a lot of light to the Straw Hats. We also have so much more light into the horrible events of the world government. We have the Savaudi Slave Shop situation and the bad track record of the Warlords. It's not a good look when the two times that the Straw Hats have stepped in to help out a country, it had been at the hands of a warlord who the Marines approved and also did not stop. And this could not be more of a boost to the Straw Hats. Like almost everyone we saw going into the reverie were people that the Straw Hats helped, except for what, like Wapol? It made me realize that the reverie is going to be the place where we get hundreds of chapters worth of payoff by having the reverie be a place where essentially all of the previous characters get to talk and influence the story. I am hyped about this, but also I just want to state, 
I don't trust the reverie. Like something's gotta go wrong. If things change, don't get me wrong, it would be a very beautiful, optimistic moment where the whole world learns that like, oh yeah, maybe we can be better. Maybe we can change. But then again, it's the world government, all right? Like my hopes are, my hopes are like on the ground, lower even. Things can only go bad. Lastly, I want to talk about all of the setup that we've done. In Zoe, we get so much setup. We got Baltigo, the revolutionary HQ that got destroyed by Blackbeard. And that can't be the end of it, right? There's no way that after all of the stuff that just happened, they just get folded. So something must have happened. Maybe the revolutionary army ran off. Maybe they had a fake HQ. But there is no way that the revolutionary army just gets wiped out. I refuse to believe it. The other bit of setup we got was the fact that Whitebeard's crew had a fallout with Blackbeard. So Marco is maybe not in a good spot right now, followed by the fact that former Whitebeard captains are getting killed off by a fake Whitebeard son. That's right, I said fake. I refuse. Look, even if this guy is his real son, I refuse to believe it. I don't. I'm coping. <laughs> I'm coping with this. I refuse to believe this is Whitebeard's son, all right? With a fake mother Whitebeard wanting inheritance money. This is set up for something, but I don't think this is Whitebeard's son. I refuse. But anyways, the faker is a warlord and he's going around destroying Whitebeard's fleet. We also have Momonosuke, who is apparently not just a creepy kid, but instead a creepy lord figure, which is funny. We have gotten a lot of princess stories, but I wasn't expecting a prince story. He's playing an important role in Wano, not only because he wants to liberate the country, but he is like the thriving figure for Zo. It's even more emphasized by the fact that he teamed up with Luffy, so this fight against Kaido is going to be even bigger than I thought. Especially when we consider that Momonosuke was capable of giving orders to Zanisha. Like, can we talk about that? Zanisha is ordered to walk around for over a century, and Momo was able to command it. Like a mech. Zanisha is a giant elephant mech. Just like how Crybaby was able to communicate with Sea Kings, now we're getting Momonosuke communicating with Zanisha. And I think this would be fabulous to have in the end game. So there's just a bunch of things. We're looking forward to the reverie. We got the Wado plotline. We also have like, oh yeah, we have Buggy. He's just out there doing side quest. Every single thing that he does is completely legal. So he's just going out there and pillaging. <laughs> it's crazy. We got Marco and Whitebeard's fake kid. I still refuse to believe it. And we have Luffy going to get back Sanji, which by the way, I am surprised that Zoro didn't come along. I think Zoro would have been like the guy to bring back Sanji, just considering how he's kind of been that guy who's had some of the strongest moments with Sanji. But maybe Zoro's like, eh, he, he can handle it. That's kind of been the dynamic. Anyways, thanks to all my patrons who are currently taking an 8 hour mountain climbing class in order to be able to single handedly climb up Zo. I personally already got my bag of popcorn and some binoculars just to see that happen. It will take a while though, so in the meantime, I'm gonna go read the next arc.